Uh, some fun in the Word of God this morning. Um, your pastor is doing a series through Proverbs, he was telling me, and he asked me if I could just, if I wouldn't mind, could I follow along? And he gave me my assignment, Proverbs chapter 15. That's where we're going to be going. And if you have your Bibles, you'll want to start turning there, uh, Proverbs chapter 15. Um, I want to talk about, like, what difference does my words make? The power of words, uh, watching our words having wisdom in what we say or what we don't say. I was at a referee meeting last week. First time I had been to one of the Mid-Michigan Officials Association here because I now live here amongst you. Sorry for your bad luck. I'm back. <laughs> but uh, uh, we were reminded as referees that we need to be careful in what we say or what we don't say. And of course, being a 37-year veteran of officiating, I have told younger officials, what you don't say will never hurt you. <laughs> so it, it's, there's power in our, our words. And so uh, thinking about that, let me start you off. Looks like some of you need to be a little more energized this morning. So let me start off with some quotes here to help us think about the words that we say. I'm often reminded, I uh, think about the words of Winston Churchill. Now, I've also been at a leadership conference with some of you this past week. I know that maybe there's some millennials here who don't know who Winston Churchill is or was. So Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And, and uh, he was put into office uh, during World War II, and he, is, in fact, is often looked at as the leader of the Allied movement that gave victory in World War II. No one really liked him. The people of Great Britain didn't like him because he didn't watch what his words always were. He was very crass sometimes with his words, and the people didn't want him. But I believe he was, at that moment, used by God in history to lead not only the, the, the Brits, but to lead the Allies to victory. So that was a leader who doesn't, doesn't always watch what he say. He didn't have Twitter, but maybe he's very similar in some regards to a leader that we probably are familiar with. Now, this is what Winston Churchill, just so you know, that our president of the United States is not the only one who speaks things that people don't like to hear. Winston Churchill is noted as having said this. He was at a party one time. And this lady came up to him, and he had been drinking a little bit, and, she's, and uh, she said to him, Sir, you are terribly drunk. And he said, Madam, you are ugly, but tomorrow I'll be sober. <laughs> so, yeah, think about that for a minute, okay? So, the power of words. Now, having said that, I like to share a little bit about a guy named Boudreaux. And I can do that. Is there anybody here like from Baton Rouge, Louisiana? Okay. So I've got some relatives down in the Baton Rouge area, and I tease them because Boudreaux was a Cajun. He was from the Baton Rouge area, and he always never got things right, and he, and he was kind of clumsy with what he would say. And one time, Boudreaux and his wife, Marie, were having their first fight, and it was a big one. And Boudreaux said to her, he said, when we got married, you promised to love, honor, and obey. And Marie replied, I know, but I didn't want to start an argument in front of all them people at the wedding. <laughs> all right. So then we have one more with Boudreaux here. Boudreaux, he was called to his bank to discuss his financial accounts. And it said, it, the, the banker said, your finances are in terrible shape, your checking account is way overdrawn, and your loans are overdue. Yeah, I know, said Boudreaux. It's my wife, Marie. She's out of control. The banker asked Boudreaux, well, why do you allow your wife to spend more money than you have? Yeah, I'll tell you the truth, Mr. Banker. I'd rather argue with you than with her. <laughs> so the power of our words, right words, being civil. And I'm saddened. You know, I'm 63 years old, I've been around a while now, and I have seen our, in our society, uh, uh, the culture like today is, t is, it's awful. Sometimes I feel like I'm an alien to this culture that we are in. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. Now, I grew up in the 60s, so I remember some of that civil disobedience that was going on, but I really believe that what we are experiencing now is that plus exponential. It's been magnified greatly. And we see it in morality, we see it politically, we see it socially, we see it in education. There's just a, a disdain for one another. And a speech 
that has become increasingly corrosive. And I don't have to give you any illustrations. Um, if you just, and I don't recommend watching a lot of news. I don't watch very much news. But if you do, you can just see it today. So my question is, I got two questions for this message today. Here are my two questions that I seek to answer this morning. One is, where is civility today? And if civility could be found, what would happen? So let me answer those two questions by first saying the key to finding civility is, uh, is by turning to the God's word. Now, in Jeremiah, and i got a slide here for you. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture. In Jeremiah, it says, this is what the Lord says. And you don't have to turn there. We'll put it up. It's right up there. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. And so um, this morning, that's, so that's the answer to the first question, is where do we find civility? In God's Word. And if found, then what will we do? And I think we do find a passage of Scripture that speaks about being civil, and that's the passage that I was assigned this morning, Proverbs chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. So by this time, you should have it. If you're going to look, we're going to put it up on the screen here. Uh, Proverbs is one of five poetic books, five of the Old Testament. There's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, also known as Song of Songs. And Solomon wrote the Proverbs. He wrote many Proverbs. And Solomon is known as that man of wisdom. Now, when I was teaching this last year at the Potter's House in my Old Testament Bible survey class, I was sharing with the students that Solomon was this man of wisdom. And one young lady raised her hand and she said, Mr. Abbott, she said, you said that he had over 700 wives. I said, yes, he has over 700 wives. She says, how can he be known as a man of wisdom if he had over 700 wives? And of course, my answer was, well... Wisdom comes to us in many different ways. <laughs> in many, and sometimes it comes to us in 700 different ways. But this morning we're going to look to see what Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 15, 1 through 4. Some of you may have even what know the, the, at least verse 1. It says here, A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing, but the mouth of a fool belches out foolishness. The Lord is watching everywhere and keeping his eye on both the evil and the good. Gentle words are a tree of life. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. And so what happens when civility is found, which I believe we have now found a description of it, three things that I'm going to share this morning that I see. One is we're going to, we improve our understanding of one another. That's one thing that we're going to learn this morning. We improve our understanding of one another Secondly, we learn from one another. And third, we grow together. So let's look at that first one. We improve, and if, you're, and if you've got the uh, there's sermon notes here, if you're if, if just one of those people, you've got to fill in the blanks. we got you covered. Follow along. We'll fill in the blanks. We improve our, the first thing is we improve our understanding of one another. The context here is how we respond or maybe react to our interpersonal communications or actions with one another. Let's look at what Solomon has to say first. We're going to look at the negative response, and then we're going to look at, there's a negative and there's a positive when we look at these verses. First we'll look at the negative, then we'll look at the positive. He says, but harsh words make tempers flare. That, that high, idea of harsh words are, corro it, it, here's the definition, corrosive, hard. Uh, they have emotion built into them, condemning, uh, difficult. difficult. Uh, the, the Hebrew, uh, Hetzav, it says, pain, hurt, toil, or sorrow. Now, here's some examples. I guess I can give you some examples of harsh words, although I don't think we need too many examples. We can probably understand, picture in our mind, but we probably, I hate you, can, come, it can really be harsh. You're awful. You stink. You suck. Uh, which, which, but with a different beginning consonant. Um, you're a piece of work. All right? Um, the, these are generally reactive and they're filled with emotion. And the result is generally a response of equal or greater intensity. And the end result can be evidenced or seen through door slamming, uh, walking away, which isn't altogether bad when there's an argument going on, or, or, but, but, or sadly, 
some type of physical contact. Now, I can attest to that. I remember years ago when I was in college, on Sunday night, and, and Michelle and I, uh, we, we were on West Campus at Ferris. This is uh, circa 1980. Some of you weren't born yet. And, uh, um, but it was about 1980. And Michelle and I were actually doing youth ministry here at Grace Bible. We did youth ministry for seven years. And uh, even though while I was a student at Ferris, we would come back to Nuego on weekends and stay at my folks, and then we would attend church, and we would be active with our, with our young people. But on Sunday nights, just before we head back up to Big Rapids, I'd be in the gym playing ball with the local guys, all the guys I grew up with. And we always knew how, you know, and, and, and we would play ball, we would trash talk each other, you know, you, you, no game, Abbott, you don't have any game, you know, in your face, you know, stuff like that, you know. And we would trash talk each other, but we always knew how far we could push one another. And we always knew where the limit was, where the line was. But there was this new guy in the gym, big guy, about 6'5", 250. You would think, given my stature, that I would know when to zip it. <laughs> but we're, we're back and forth, and I'm kind of on this guy. And he's getting out, and, and now we, he and I got it going back and forth. And then finally, he comes up to me, towering over me, and I'm not yielding because I'm just not real smart, and, and I'm not yielding, and he says to me, do you want me to hit you? Now, I didn't realize he was speaking rhetorically, uh, so there was no answer to the question. Boom, he hit me, and I ended up spending the night uh, I got, we got up the Big Rapids, got home, I got in our apartment, and I was feeling really woozy and all that, and, and Michelle ended up having, uh, uh, had our neighbor watch our kids, and she took me to Big Rapids Hospital, I had a slight concussion, I ended up spending the night, all right? So, heat of the moment stuff can happen when, with our words, and I have seen this as a, as a referee of 37 years, I have seen many, many times where coaches and referees get they can lose their mind in the heat of the moment, saying things that does not help, is fuel for the fire, heat of the moment type stuff. And it can have devastating results. Now, on the positive side, Solomon says, a gentle answer deflects anger. That idea of a gentle answer means to speak softly, not loudly, not led by emotion, uh, and it's a reply to, again, something was said or some action that was done. Uh, it's, there's a gentleness here, a kindness, where you're actually interested in the other party. Uh, a tenderness, a soft, delicate. And so I believe that to give a soft, gentle answer, to be on the positive side of this heated moment, active listening really helps. And active listening means that I'm able to listen to you and while you're talking, I'm not thinking about my, what, what my reply will be, but while you're talking, I'm listening so that when you're done, if I, see, I'm not just hearing, I'm listening. You know, hearing is like Charlie Brown hearing the teacher, wah, 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 but listening is being able to then articulate and speak back the very words that were spoken to you. And I really believe that when we do that, then there's a pause, the emotion drops, and that soft answer deflects the anger. Now, if you're not very good at active listening, then, then just wait for that moment to pause and to find something gentle to say. Like Michelle and I sometimes, if we're into an argument, and we do, couples argue, that's part of marriage, okay? Um, arguments in marriage are not, do not merit the, this comment. Arguments in marriage do not merit I didn't sign out for this. I'm out of here. No, you did sign up for that when you said your vows. That's just part of marriage. It's just your marriage showing up now. That's all. And so Michelle and I have been married for 45 years. We still have arguments. But we found that in the process of arguing, sometimes just bringing it down. And I'll say, oftentimes I'll say something like this to Michelle. I'll say, okay, um, I got something I got to share with you. Uh, and I'm going to mess up the table a little bit. But if you just listen to me, let me get it out, and then we, you know, and, and that works. And the same works for her. That soft gentleness brings it right down. I remember many, quite a few years ago, I was interested in working college basketball. I'd been doing high school basketball for a number of years, and now I was, I was in my early 40s, and I was interested in doing college basketball, so I would go each summer, I'd pay money, and go to college camps and they'd bring in clinicians, they'd bring in 
uh, Division I college officials who would then um, mentor us and, and so on. And I had this one official, his name was DeCarlos Terry. Now he passed away a few years ago, but he officiated uh, some uh, Division I, he did the, uh, the, the, the Glee Act, Division II, Ferris, Grand Valley, and so on. And I remember uh, them sharing the story about how he uh, was in a game, I don't remember what game it was, because it was quite a few years ago, and all I remember that the coach on one team was just heated against him, didn't like the call that he made, and asked for a timeout. It's one of those deals where the coach asked for a timeout, but then they want to talk to you instead of their team. And so he is just in to Carlos Terry's ear with all sorts of things, negative, just spewing out, and to Carlos Terry got a little, thing, a little cup of water from the water thing that was into the bench, and he's drinking the water while he's getting all this earful. And then when the coach was done, he put his cup, to Carlos Terry, the referee, put his cup of water down, and he says, y'all done, coach? Let's play ball. And on they went. Nothing. There was nothing. Coach was fine with that, you know? See, that soft answer really does deflect answer. And that's where James says this. James says in chapter 1, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So gentleness helps us appreciate each other better, and our relationships are made stronger. That's the first point this morning. Now, the second point is... We learn from one another. We learn from one another. Um, um, when there's civility, we not only enhance our interpersonal relationships, but we learn from one another. Uh, it says, that, you know, back to the verse 2, and we don't have it on the screen here, but maybe we do. Did I put it? No, I don't think I put it on the screen. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing, but the mouth of a fool belches out foolishness. Now, again, we're going to look at the negative, and then we'll look at the positive. On the negative aspect, that whole idea about being a fool, the, and the Hebrew word is just simply, it's a person who, who belches out, okay? What, what's coming out of them is like belching. If you ever had anybody belch in your face, it's very, very unattractive. It's not good at all. And, uh, and that's what, when fools speak, that's what it's like. Foolish people, and I put a definition, uh, uh, in, a blank is foolish people, and I gave you some definitions of what it means to be foolish. Stupid, silly. Idiotic, half-witted, witless, brainless, mindless, thoughtlessness, imprudent, irresponsible, inju injudicious, indiscreet, unwise, unintelligent, unreasonable. Maybe you've, you've used those terms addressing people, okay? Now, foolish people. Now, people can come across in different, different ways. Um, there are some people, I'm like one of them, who has kind of like a driver mentality, real visionary. And we don't always take time to think through the details. We know the big picture, we know where we want to go, and that's where we go. Sometimes those types of personalities are called ready, are called ready fire, aim people. <laughs> okay. Now sometimes it works out great and people flourish under ready, fire, aim people, but other times uh, the cost and time and people and they come across as really foolish. Now let me just take a little survey here this morning. I, I look at people in, the, in two types in this way. There's what we call dreamers. Dreaming people are people who see the big picture. They're visionaries. They dream. They think big. All right. They don't really worry about details. They just see the big picture. Now, just by your own admission, just a raise of hands, how many of you would throw yourself in the I'm a dream big visionary type person? Okay. All right. Great. Now, then there's the detail people. They, they, they don't necessarily think big, but they think carefully through the details, and we're not moving forward until we've put the steps in place. These are detail people. How many here in the room are detail people? Okay, and some of you are lying. <laughs> okay, so here's, the, now, now here, here's my point. You don't go to the same meeting, okay? Detail people are not allowed to attend the visionary dreamer meeting. And the reason is they're dreaming. They're thinking big. They're, they're looking at big things. And you don't need a person who's a detail person going, 
That'll never work. You shouldn't do it. You know, dreaming people are the type of people who want to go, like in the church facility, you're remodeling, and you're thinking, can we make a room where the room, where the, where the, the room goes up and down and the elevator stays in one place? Okay? They, okay, they're just dreaming. Okay? They might not even make any sense, but you don't need one of these detailed people going, that'll never work, and that color will never go. No. And the same thing is true in the detail meeting. When you have the detailed people to get, getting together, when they're thinking through the details, they don't need somebody to say, well, I, th you know, and just throw out some idea that doesn't make sense at all. So, now, and, and here's why. Because if the detailed people attend the dreaming meeting, they're going to look foolish. They're, what they're speaking is just like, doesn't make any sense. And when the detailed people are putting things together, the dreamer people shouldn't come because they look like they won't be making any sense. And I know it, it's just not wise, and you look foolish. See, that's how you can look foolish and not be a wise person. Now, I can give Credence to this, in my own experience, when we planted New Community Church down the road, we got up into the building, we were meeting down in the storefront downtown, We'd, and uh, then we got into this building down here on, on Monday, and uh, brought, it was a buffing shop, and I just remember just thinking big, I walked in, there was like a, a car with an engine hanging out, and I'm going, this could be a great worship center, and we could do this with this, and we could do children's ministry over here, and this, and some of my detail people were just shaking their heads, not seeing it. So then when we get into the, get into the, after we did our demolition, now we're in the construction. Now follow me along, particularly if, you're, if, particularly if you know construction type things, you should really listen carefully here, and you'll see what I mean. So uh, the dreamers were actually taking care of some of the construction. And I was one of them. And so what did we do? We, uh, we ran our electrical. We ran our electrical through the studs, through the posts like we did. Got it hooked up to the breaker box like you're supposed to do. And then we put our drywall up. Yep, got our drywall. Gooped it, sanded, did our painting. And then we thought, oh, we should probably get an electrical inspection. <laughs> um, what would an electrical inspector look at if you've got drywall up covering your studs? They want to look to see where your wires are running. And so we pleaded with our building inspector. We pleaded, could, could, could we somehow make this work? Could we maybe just cut a, 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 a gap on the wall and you can just, no. They, we had to take all that drywall down so they could see what was being done, okay? That's what happens when dreamers are doing detail work. It actually happened to us, and, uh, and you look foolish, okay? And that's where Jesus says this. So Jesus says, a large crowd had been around him. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, uh, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Then he says, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh. They would say, there's that person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Of course, Jesus is talking about your own life and counting the cost, but we can make very practical application out of that saying that wise people are detailed and they take care, there's a, there's a prudence about them. Visionary people see the big things, but when we're doing the, when we're, we're in the wrong camp, we look foolish, see? Because foolish people, they give no consideration, they don't think things, they're not cautious, they don't ask other people, and then what they say is like a belching out, like a folly. That's the negative side. Now, let's look at the positive side. The wise person. The wise person. Now, I thought this was kind of fascinating when I was studying this. The Hebrew word for wise here is kakamim. Has anybody ever heard this phrase? I, I was trying to find any. I couldn't find it. No, but I know I've heard in growing up what kind of kakamini story is that. Who, who have heard that? Please, somebody. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and it comes, it kind of comes from this. It, it, that's a derivative of this. But this word is talking about wise and skillful and shrewd and crafty and cunning. And the wise seem to balance their decisions by making prudent, caution, common sense. They value the work and others. There's no hassle because they desire things to be good. They live by the old printer's adage, 
think thrice, measure twice, and only cut once. Now, I'm kind of semi-retired, and recently I attended my class, my high school class's 45th reunion, high school reunion. I don't recommend it um, <laughs> because uh, we got there and I didn't realize we had so many pharmacists in the room. I mean, we're all talking about different prescriptions that we're taking and different medications we're taking. But, but, but seriously, what I enjoyed about uh, being with this group is they're talking, what do, we, what do people my age talk about? Social Security, retirement, pensions, what plan do you got? Are you uh, taking the full retirement? Are you going to go to your retirement age? We talk about that. And what amazed me was many of my classmates were just very wise. They had planned they had planned for this day ahead of time when they were young. Michelle and I didn't, but, but, but many had done. They planned, and they had multiple income streams coming in, and all of that just, why? And I'm just listening to that, and it's wise. There's a lot of wisdom there, there's a lot of prudence. And see, the scripture says wise people make knowledge appealing. And so Michelle and I, we have heard stuff like that, and I, I didn't have to go to my 45th class reunion to hear that. We have known that over years about the wisdom of planning and so on and so forth to the point that we've instilled it in our grandson, Christopher, who some of you know, he's in the National Guard right now, but he is already preparing to have multiple careers that will create multiple income streams. He's 19 years old and he already has a Roth IRA uh, that he's putting money aside that he won't touch that by the time he's 65 it'll probably be a million dollars. And so, you know, so we have learned and we have passed that on to him. See. That's what wise people make knowledge appealing. And, you know, and when you're not necessarily a wise person, my wife is, I'm not so much. I'm one of the fire, I'm one of the ready, fire, aim people. But when we hear wise, prudent people talk, we listen, we take note, and it makes it very appealing and it's desired. You, you, you really want to have the same thing in your life. See, wise people are really the people you want to be around with, you know. Wise people just make such great decisions, okay. They make really, really good decisions. They have a lot of common sense. In fact, I've known people, I have known people who are extremely intelligent but low on common sense. I've known uh, people who are uh, just the opposite, okay. Um, but now, how do these two come together? Uh, I remember uh, it was like 1987 or 1988. I know I'm dating a little bit, but this true story here. Uh, I was going to Bible college, and I was working for a firm in Sparta, and I was their information systems manager. That's just a lofty title for a guy, uh, a one-man computer programming shop. We had about 200 employees in the company, and uh, I was responsible for all the computer stuff, all the technical stuff. And uh, we had to figure out back, and this was back in the late 80s, so this was some pretty cutting-edge stuff at that time. They wanted us... When we packaged, it was a, we, I worked for a company called Paxec. They're not, they're, they've, they've been bought out and changed the name, but they're still in the business. Uh, they're a poly bag company. And so uh, they create plastic film and they convert it into plastic bags or they sell it by film on the rolls. And they wanted a way to barcode. They wanted to put a label on the product with a barcode on it. That way we could scan it and we could start doing some other cutting edge stuff. But we first needed to somehow print barcodes. Now back in the day, today it's easy, but back in the day, in the late 80s, I actually had to figure it out. So I went down to a company called Sonnevelt's in Grand Rapids and I met with their information systems manager. And he made it sound easy because that's what they had the same computer set up they were doing and they were doing what we wanted to do and I remember that guy sitting back old guy sitting back in the chair hands like this and he goes oh yeah afternoon job not a problem and then he would think about it and he'd go yeah but the only hooker in that deal was and then this and yeah but the only hooker in that deal was and the person I was with were kind of laughing going I've never heard anybody use that phrase the only hooker in that deal sorry and we're in church too so um, please don't let that be your main point that you remember this morning that the only you walk out thinking the only hooker in that deal but he was thinking of the flaws that was happening and and that's how he characterized it well then after talking to him see that was kind of like folly at, at first it sounded appealing but then when I talked to his actual programmers the ones actually doing the job they let me know, oh, now, Clint, you're going to have a learning curve. It's going to take you a while to get it done. But, but when you do, you'll, you'll, you'll like it, but it's going to be a learning curve. You see, that was wisdom, okay? And, and so sometimes the two 
can look like folly, they can look bad, sometimes one looks good, better than the other, but they really do work. There is a place for that. There is a place for that person who is the ready, fire, aim person, but believe me, it's always great then to talk to the people who are wise, planners, prudent, cautious, and so on. They're a pleasure to be around. They make it so appealing. Gentle words, words of prudence, civility, help us develop our personal relationships and we learn from one another. And the third point is we grow together. We grow together. Gentle words, it says in verse 4, gentle words are a tree of life. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Now again, let's start with the negative and then we'll switch over to the positive. The negative is a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Literally, it means perversion is in the crushing of the spirit. It's talking about crooked dealing. It's talking about words that fracture, words that shatter, words that crush, words that take the spirit and the breath out of a person. Without civility, there's no regard for one another. And we see this today. Neg negativity in our culture can be so corrosive. It eats away at people. And we get so issue-oriented, we forget about relationships with people. I mean, if you watch any news, and again, I'm not suggesting you watch much, but you see in the media, on the left or on the right, President of the United States says, if you don't like it here, you can leave. Ouch! And then you hear on the other side, impeach, he's not my president. Negative, corrosive. Everybody, they all do it. And yet, what we say should matter, because it does matter. Words can hurt. I grew up, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And there's a sense in which, yeah, you can kind of take charge and not allow words to hurt you, but many people can, are hurt by words. Words can crush. Words can hurt. Can hurt. They can harm. And when we fail to honestly share, when we're cunning and not forthcoming, and we use words to deceive, it literally will take the breath away from people. And when we say one thing and we do another and we're not dependable and we fail to keep our promises, it can have a crushing impact on people. But on the positive side, a gentle word is literally, it says, a healing tongue means wholesome, soothing words. Ten chapters over in Proverbs 25, it says, Timely advice is lovely, like golden apples in a silver basket. Words that are positive literally can bring healing. They are said with the utmost care for the person they're directed at. They produce growth. And it says here that they are... They, they bring about a tree of life. That's the picture that we have that, the, that, that Solomon gives us. A tree of life. This tree of life is green, flowing, reviving. And it's literally talking about a growing, flourishing tree. Now, if you just did a real quick little study on what is this tree of life about, outside of the book of Genesis, here are some of the... the, the it, it only appears a few times. It appears in Proverbs chapter 3 where it talks about this tree of life produces wisdom. In chapter 11 of Proverbs, it produces uh, good deeds. Uh, in chapter 13, it produces fulfilled dreams. And then we find in the book of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, again it's talking about this tree of paradise, of God's paradise, and referring back then again to the tree of life that's mentioned in Genesis. In fact, here's the first occurrence in Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve had sinned, then the Lord God said, look at the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. You see, God banished them from the garden so that they would not eat from the tree of life. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. And I remember we stud I studied that many, many years ago. And uh, the reason being that Adam and Eve had fallen and were in a sinful condition and they needed to be redeemed. And God did not want them to partake of the tree of life because they would live forever in that fallen, sinful condition. And so he withheld that tree of life from them. But the tree of life makes its reappearance in the book of the Revelation. It's known as providing healing for the nations. And, Proverbs, and, and Solomon uses that tree of life idea to talk about our soothing, gentle words of wisdom can actually have a healing effect with people. 
They have that positive impact upon other people. Our words don't have to be a sewer or a dump spewing things out. Rather, they can be positive, healing, and life-giving, and, uh, and, and produce an effect that God blesses. And so, this morning, I just want to say, when we demonstrate civility, soft words toward one another, it strengthens our relationships. It produces learning from one another. And there is a healing that leads to great personal and spiritual growth. I can use really cutting words. Not bragging. God has gifted me. I know I'm an effective communicator. I'm an effective communicator because I've studied, I've learned but also by gift. And I know the power of words. And when Michelle and I have those moments, I know that she is no match for my arguments and my words. I have won arguments at the expense of relationships. I have cut people in my past and harmed with my words because what I said, I thought I was defending an issue or a position and forgot that as a Christian, it's all about relationships. That's why at Better Life Church, we, our, our, our motto was loving God, loving people, loving life. And we'll only love life when we have a great relationship with God and when we love people. And so, having said that, uh, I desire to be a person who uses my words, I pray carefully. There are times that we have to speak firmly, but firmly and cutting are two different things. And we should never really defend an issue over at the expense of a relationship, particularly a, a political issue or a social issue. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that. I want to be one that my words are a tree of life, that they make a positive difference. I want to be a person who enters into positive relationships with people and uses my words so that that person can grow and become all that God has to be. And having said that, I don't think I'm alone. I'm sure that even here in this congregation, that there's probably some that have at time used words inappropriately, maybe to defend issues, maybe to make a point, and maybe it's harmed relationships. So my prayer is that we have civility and that we trust the Holy Spirit to lead us, to empower us, and to guide us. And so this morning, if you found yourself, as I have shared with my, about myself, being harsh and lacking gentleness, I just want to pray this morning with you. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, to lead us, to give us wisdom, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to be angry. To seek first to understand, and then be understood. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the power of words. Father, we realize that our words have great power. They can, they can do great harm on the negative side, and yet they can do so many wonderful things on the positive side. For those of us, Father, that have used our words to defend an issue at the expense of a person, to make a point at the expense of a person. God, we just pray you forgive us. We want, we want to be people who, have, who speak words of life, that are life-changing, life-giving. Holy Spirit, fill us and guide us and help us to be that positive, prudent, wise person whose path is measured and pictured because we produce this tree of life. 
We're trusting you this. We praise you for all that you've done for us, and we give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we have this closing song of worship.